Okay, here we go. Stand by. Three, two, one. The thinking atheist. It's not a person. It's a symbol. An idea. The population of atheists in this country is going through the roof. Rejecting faith. Pursuing knowledge. Challenging the sacred. If I tell the truth, it's because I tell the truth. Not because I put my hand on a book and made a wish. And working together for a more rational world. Take the risk of thinking for yourself. Much more happiness, truth, beauty, and wisdom will come to you that way. Assume nothing. Question everything. And start thinking. This is the Thinking Atheist Podcast. Hosted by Seth Andrews. So I was talking to a couple of friends the other day. These are good people. They're uh, friends we play tennis with, and they are both Christians. I think in the more casual sense, they're not evangelicals. You know, they're not taking missions trips, and they're not going door to door, and They're not all that interested in the Bible, et cetera, but they do call themselves Christians, and they do go to one of those kind of, um, I don't know, cool, hip, modern-type churches, you know, one of those churches where the pastor's got an earring and a tattoo and and skinny jeans kind of churches, (laughs) you know, and they're playing Hillsong and and, uh, casting crowns from the stage, yeah, that kind of church, okay? But they're really good people, and they have been friends of ours for a great many years. But we're having a conversation, and it gets political. And I weigh in occasionally, but in a room full of conservatives, I found myself just sort of sitting back and waiting. I'm waiting for the window, waiting for the opportunity, trying to do a cost-benefit if I'm going to engage or not, right? Is this the time I really want to get into it? And the subject of... Abortion comes up. Now, I know a lot of people who abortion is the beginning and the end of any political argument. Like we saw with Donald Trump, you can come forward and you can announce that you are anti-abortion, you are pro-life, quote-unquote pro-life, and Trump had actually changed his own position when it became politically expedient. You know, he used to be pro-choice, and then all of a sudden he's courting favor with the evangelical crowd, and he switches and says, oh, I'm pro-life, we must protect the babies, you know. And um, so for many people, they have excused the vote for somebody like Donald Trump by saying, well, ultimately it comes down to abortion for me, and I can just stop doing all my own thinking. Well, fine. We're talking here. And my friends finally ask me, they go, well, we think we know your position on abortion, but what do you think, really? And I look them both in the eye and I said, what I think is, it's none of your goddamn business. (laughs) And there was, you know, a silence afterwards. Uh, Okay. And I'm like, it's not your business what a woman does with her body. It's not your pastor's business what a woman does with her body, right? It's not your religion's business. It's not a politician's business. It is the business of that person. And uh, I stand against this idea that you get to tell somebody else what to do with their own body. You know, I I think even if there's a moral issue at play, let's say there is a God and he's hugely alarmed by all of this, that's still a conversation between God and the woman, And if God was genuinely that upset about it, he has the power to intervene, right? He can appear to the woman as he appeared to Mary with news and just say, hey, quit it, (laughs) you know, don't do this, or I forbid this, that God could show up and he could put a stop to things. He's God, you know, he can do everything. But this idea that a whole mobilized political panel of churches and evangelical politicians have to come together to intervene, to essentially tell other people what to do with their bodies, to me is just insane. And they had not much to say about that response. But, uh, you know, the issue of abortion, even in some parts of the atheist movement or atheist culture and atheist community is probably the best way to say it. It is, I think, in many ways, a, a complex and challenging subject, so polarizing in many ways, and so heavy, such a serious subject that I had put off actually doing a show about it until I wrote a chapter about abortion in my latest book called Confessions of a Former Fox News Christian. 
The audio version of that chapter runs 40 minutes, and I'm just going to play the entire chapter for you because I feel it's well defended. I feel like it's a responsible approach to the issue of abortion. I think it'll be a good conversation starter if you're in a dialogue with somebody who is quote-unquote pro-life or anti-choice or anti-abortion, right? There are a lot of things that I did not know about the whole reproductive process when I was an evangelical. I just heard the horror stories. I just heard even the caricature of what the procedure of abortion was. These traumatizing tales they would bring to us and these stories that all the women who went through it were totally scarred and they never recovered from the guilt. And many of them, you know, they ran to the feet of Jesus and said, please forgive me for murdering my child. This is the stuff that they used to tell us. Hey, this is not how that goes down. So when I took my own journey through this issue, just to know my own mind, I thought maybe a chapter on the subject might help someone else in their own journey or perhaps to explain their own journey to a third party, you know, a religious person or something like that. Now, because I do not want to interrupt the chapter, I want to play the entire thing without interruption. Let me take my break right here, and I will be right back with Chapter 11 from my book, Confessions of a Former Fox News Christian. The chapter is called Abortion, Science, the Soul, and the Question of Personhood. I'll be right back to read it to you after this. Okay, this is a 40-minute excerpt from the audiobook version of my recent book, Confessions of a Former Fox News Christian. Chapter 11, Abortion, Science, the Soul, and the Question of Personhood. It was July 1992. Governor Bill Clinton was on the presidential campaign trail. His limousine was about to transport him from New York's Intercontinental Hotel to Central Park for his morning jog, when he was approached by a man asking for an autograph. The man, Christian broadcaster Harley David, suddenly tried to hand Clinton a clear plastic container. Inside the container was a fetus. Harley David was best known as sidekick to Christian talk host and radical anti-abortion activist Randall Terry. The two men had orchestrated the stunt to be broadcast nationally on the syndicated radio show Randall Terry Live. Bill Clinton quickly retreated into his limousine, and Harley David was arrested. Randall Terry's broadcast was carried on an affiliate of the station where I worked, and I heard the scenario as it played out in real time. Bill Clinton and Randall Terry represented two opposite sides of the abortion issue— Bill Clinton had long expressed a personal opposition to abortion, but he supported Roe v. Wade, the landmark 1973 Supreme Court decision that protected abortion rights under the Constitution. By the way, Clinton's an example of someone who might oppose abortion personally, yet respects the law and female reproductive autonomy. Randall Terry had founded the radical anti-abortion organization Operation Rescue, and been arrested more than 40 times for blocking entrances to abortion centers and protesting on private property. He ran for the U.S. House of Representatives in 1998 under the Right to Life Party, and he pathetically tried to challenge Barack Obama in the presidential primaries of 2012. Terry's single focus was the morality and legality of abortion, He opposed birth control pills as, quote, human pesticide and demanded jail time for all women who get abortions. The New York stunt with the fetus was ostensibly supposed to humanize the abortion issue and force Bill Clinton to confront his endorsement of, quote, child murder. Clinton minimized the encounter as no big deal, but that exchange revealed much about anti-abortion attitudes and the desperation of evangelicals to stop the practice. Randall Terry's tactics were considered extreme by most mainstream Christians, but they, and I, shared his opinion that it's a child, not a choice. Life was a miracle that began at conception, 
the sperm and egg marrying in divine destiny, immediately producing a tiny human soul that would soon express itself beyond the womb and find its place in eternity. This is a perspective that many pro-choice activists miss. I attended the 2012 Imagine No Religion 2 conference in British Columbia, and a panel of abortion activists spoke at length about the evangelical assault on female reproductive rights and the patriarchal edicts of Christian fundamentalism. They were rightly concerned over Christianity's attempt to procreate itself into dominance, patriarchal notions of female subjection, and religious control over humankind. Yet none of the panelists mentioned a key and driving force behind Christianity's opposition to abortion, the sincere desire to protect human life. The panelists were striking the target, but they had missed a ring. If choice advocates genuinely seek to change minds and the culture, conversations with the opposition must be rooted in understanding, perhaps even empathy for the often sincere and good intentions that drive the war on reproductive choice. As Cassandra Clare once said, no one is ever the villain of their own story, and choice advocates will help themselves by focusing their energies less on shouts and accusations and more on dialogue and education. We should, whenever possible, foster communication instead of mere clamor. I wasn't insulted out of my religious beliefs, and I'm not convinced we can insult anti-choice activists out of their convictions. Theirs is an insular world in desperate need of a larger perspective, a perspective that you and I can provide. Carl Sagan says this in his article titled The Question of Abortion, A Search for Answers. Of the many actual points of view, it is widely held, especially in the media, which rarely have the time or the inclination to make fine distinctions, that there are only two, pro-choice and pro-life. This is what the two principal warring camps like to call themselves, and that's what we'll call them here. In the simplest characterization, a pro-choicer would hold that the decision to abort a pregnancy is to be made only by the woman. The state has no right to interfere. And a pro-lifer would hold that from the moment of conception, the embryo or fetus is alive, that this life imposes on us a moral obligation to preserve it, and that abortion is tantamount to murder. Both names, pro-choice and pro-life, were picked with an eye toward influencing those whose minds are not yet made up. Few people wish to be counted either as being against freedom of choice or as opposed to life. Indeed, freedom and life are two of our most cherished values, and here they seem to be in fundamental conflict. I've met some pro-choice influencers who would read the above paragraph and feel betrayed. How could any advocate for a woman's bodily autonomy even imply that abortion opponents might be morally motivated people? Those evangelicals are anti-woman, they're anti-choice, they're anti-human rights. And with these protestations, the indignant remain locked on the effects instead of a root cause, the desire to protect a defenseless soul. I can hear the protestations of many here. Why is a man rendering an opinion on the abortion question? Who cares what he thinks? He's a man. I reject these kinds of purity tests regarding human rights issues. I don't need to be black to grasp that racism is immoral and why. I don't have to be ex-Muslim to see the moral contradictions in Islam. I can be straight and promote LGBT rights. I can be non-military and oppose unjust wars. And I can be male and value gender equality and reproductive autonomy, engaging in moral reasoning alongside my fellow human beings. These are human rights issues on the table for discussion across the board, especially recognizing that the abortion issue is often decided by couples, not just an individual. With the critical question of personhood in play, rationalists across tribal lines 
should do what rationalists do, approach the issue respectfully to achieve the most rational and ethical answer. My small contribution here is, I hope, a perspective on many anti-choice activists who are not motivated by a desire to subjugate women, but genuinely grieve over their perceptions of child murder. I understand that the often noble intentions of the faithful produce some genuinely horrifying results. And the United States has seen recent examples of fearful, ignorant, and sometimes bigoted God warriors exerting biblically justified control over individual reproductive choices. A prime example is Alabama's 2019 Human Life Protection Act, a near-total ban on abortion, even in cases of rape and incest, which was passed in the Alabama Senate by 25 white men. Other states like Georgia, Ohio, Kentucky, Mississippi, and Louisiana have banned abortion after six weeks, before many women even realize that they're pregnant. In 2019, an unprecedented surge in Republican-majority states passed anti-abortion laws, those paths ultimately leading toward an imminent Supreme Court challenge of Roe v. Wade. Beyond the legislation lay the consequences to those denied access to safe abortion. Dr. Diana Foster, Director of Research at the University of California, San Francisco, helmed the Turnaway Study, the largest study to examine unwanted pregnancy and abortion in the United States. A survey of about 1,000 women revealed serious consequences for denying abortion and requiring women to bring an unwanted pregnancy to term, including the following. Health complications such as eclampsia and even death. A greater likelihood to stay with abusive partners. Anxiety, depression, and suicidal thoughts. Financial distress and inability to meet basic family necessities. According to the survey, most women who sought abortion after 20 weeks were, quote, delayed because they did not realize they were pregnant. About half of abortion patients were using contraception. Women denied an abortion had almost four times greater odds of a household income below the federal poverty level and three times greater odds of being unemployed. Beyond socioeconomic and emotional challenges, fetal birth defects remains a serious issue. Planned Parenthood highlights many anecdotes along this line, including the story of Christy B. of Virginia, who had actually planned her pregnancy, but discovered that her daughter would be born with congenital diaphragmatic hernia. She said, My husband and I were confronted with two equally horrible options, carry the pregnancy to term and watch our baby girl suffocate to death upon birth, or end the pregnancy early and say goodbye to our much-wanted and much-loved baby girl. Christy terminated the pregnancy at 21 weeks, an action that is currently illegal in 17 states. Regardless of whether the anti-abortionist motivations are noble or disgraceful, it's clear that the future of reproductive choice is on the bubble. Mainstream Christians make no distinction between a human being, a person, and a soul. The fertilized egg is a human. The developing embryo is a human. The newborn infant is a human. Much like the idea of the Holy Trinity, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit— these forms are both unique and identical, and they bear a divine fingerprint. For a moment, let's come back to the notion of the soul. Ask an everyday Christian to define the soul, and you'll likely get some nebulous response about an unseen energy that exists within the human heart and mind. This soul can't be detected by medical instruments, so it can't be measured or quantified. It's a life force that transcends the physical world and constitutes our core self, passing from this earthly plane into another realm after death. Christianity declares that the soul resides within a temporary physical shell, and it is uniquely human. While other species in the animal kingdom may have eyes and ears, fingers and toes, a heart and lungs, blood and bone, they do not, they cannot, possess a soul. 
A human soul carries with it the important attributes of identity, and, at least initially, it is inherently good. As demonstrated by common accusations against terrible people, they have no soul. Variations on the soul have long been reflected throughout philosophy and religions, yet they exist beyond any hard interpretation or scientific experiment. Soul claims are not demonstrable and remain supposedly, conveniently unfalsifiable. In 2017, I interviewed Dr. Julian Mussolino, a neuroscientist and professor of cognitive psychology and psycholinguistics at Rutgers University. Dr. Mussolino wrote a 2015 book called The Soul Fallacy, What Science Shows We Gain from Letting Go of Our Soul Beliefs. A survey of his university students revealed three common notions about the soul. One, it's immaterial and non-physical, separate from the body. Two, it's psychologically potent, driving consciousness, free will, personality, emotion, and decision-making. And three, it's immortal. In his book, Dr. Mussolino rightly notes that these concepts of an immaterial, immeasurable soul make no sense, because the soul hypothesis is also a claim about biology and can be investigated scientifically. When believers fondly like to say, as the spirit moves you, they reveal the key problem— a motivating spiritual force should and would have an observable effect on the physical brain and body. Science would be able to detect the influence of the soul as it generates thoughts, ideas, emotions, and actions within the machine of the mind. Yet no soul has ever been observed, and every, quote, eyewitness claim about an otherworldly plane fails the burden of proof and can otherwise be explained by brain chemistry, deception, or self-deception. It's a claim without evidence, a phantom without form, a popular notion that flounders upon the most rudimentary investigation. No matter how many apologist rationalizations litter the shelves of religious bookstores, the soul operates exactly as it would if it did not exist. There's simply no good reason to believe in it. Still, approximately 80% of U.S. citizens embrace some type of heaven, a place where the soul resides after physical death. Given that significant number, and the fact that 167 million Americans claim some flavor of Christianity, it becomes easier to understand why nearly half of the population opposes abortion. Often, that opposition is not motivated by a desire to discriminate against or control women, but is instead laser-focused on the unborn child, the precious soul, the human life that has no ability to defend itself. That rallying cry stirs the righteous to battle. Defenseless children are under attack, so God's army must mobilize. Ultimately, this is an evangelical crusade to defend a soul residing among the multiplying cells. That position was certainly mine when I was a young evangelical. I wasn't opposed to contraception, but once fertilization took place, the die was cast, and termination of the pregnancy was murder. The irony was that, by that standard, Yahweh was the most prolific abortion doctor in human history. Sex education isn't exactly a strong suit in the Bible Belt, but even a cursory look at the human reproductive process reveals that 50% of all fertilized eggs wash out during menstruation. Total prenatal losses approach 70% in the first weeks after fertilization. Sexual intercourse actually produces more dead, fertilized eggs than live babies. As believers in an intelligent designer, American Christians are left to explain why each of those soul-bearing eggs is excreted into the sewers. Psychologist Dr. Valerie Tirico noted the following. She said, A lot more eggs and sperm get made than will ever hook up with each other. Many more eggs get fertilized than will ever implant, and more zygotes implant than will ever grow into babies. 
The world's major religions, including even the most extremist forms of Christianity, Islam, and Judaism, tacitly acknowledge that these reproductive false starts are not people by declining to name or baptize the ones that women's bodies expel on a regular basis. She's correct. Even the more educated Christians aren't rushing out to daily baptize hundreds of thousands of failed embryos. Dr. Tariko referenced the famous Duggar family, stars of the reality television show 19 Kids and Counting. Declaring contraception a sin, Jim Bob and Michelle Duggar parented nine girls and ten boys, proudly proclaiming that they had left the procreation process to God. Tariko rightly notes that, based on the live births Michelle Duggar delivered, she also flushed somewhere between 17 and 75 embryos in order to get the family they have. Yet this case produces no righteous indignation by the anti-abortion crowd, and I suspect two reasons. One, Christians believe that the God who creates life also has the right to end it. The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. His reasons aren't important, and whatever those reasons, it's likely that earthly mortals couldn't comprehend them anyway. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been His counselor? Romans 11.34 2. Abortion opponents engage only when female choice is involved. A woman has decided to derail God's sovereign life-and-death determination, and driven by hubris, selfishness, or desperation, she has placed her own life in priority over a, quote, child. Whether the interventionists see women as biblically subject to male authority, or whether the focus is solely on protecting the embryo, the result is control, control of sexual behavior, of reproductive choices, of the female gender. Anti-abortion activists, often men, ostensibly speak for God as they lay claim upon the uterus in the name of life, and that crusade preempts all other considerations, even bodily autonomy and personal boundaries. Once we discard notions about the magical spark of divinity and root the abortion issue in the real world, how do human rights advocates address the complex issue of personhood, especially regarding a fetus developed into the second and third trimesters? Beyond the overarching reality that a woman's body is her own, with the central question of personhood in play, I think that this is a subject that people both men and women, should be able to discuss. And our discussion starts with the fertilized egg. A single cell becomes two cells and begins to multiply further. Around day 10, the fertilized egg has relocated from the fallopian tube and implanted itself in the lining of the uterus, where some cells become the placenta and others become the embryo. At four weeks, that embryo is the size of a poppy seed. Fetal heartbeat bills falsely declare that a, quote, viable person exists at the sixth week of gestation, when fetal cardiac activity can be detected. In reality, it's merely a rudimentary cluster of pulsing cells, something gynecologist and columnist Jennifer Gunter more accurately terms fetal pole cardiac activity. Dr. Michael Gazaniga is professor of psychology at the University of California, Santa Barbara. He remains one of the world's leading researchers in cognitive neuroscience. And in Chapter 1 of his 2006 book, The Ethical Brain, he describes the human embryo in its early stages. Even though the fetus is now developing areas that will become specific sections of the brain, not until the end of Week 5 and into Week 6 usually around 40 to 43 days, does the first electrical brain activity begin to occur. This activity, however, is not coherent activity of the kind that underlines human consciousness or even the coherent activity seen in a shrimp's nervous system. Just as neural activity is present in clinically brain-dead patients, early neural activity consists of unorganized neuron firing of a primitive kind. Neuronal activity by itself does not represent integrated behavior. 
In other words, these early electrical firings are unarranged signals, happening weeks before the cerebrum starts to develop, and more than a month before the frontal and temporal lobes of the brain become apparent. As described by Dr. Gazaniga, at week 13, the fetus is not a sentient, self-aware organism at this point. It is more like a sea slug, a writhing, reflex-bound hunk of sensory motor processes that does not respond to anything in a directed, purposeful way. The nervous system doesn't become cohesive until roughly the 17th week. Statistically, two-thirds of abortions occur by the eighth week of pregnancy, and 88% occur within the first 12 weeks. The canard that these early abortions kill tiny babies with fingers and toes is popular among evangelicals, but the indignant are actually referring to a barely developed cluster of cells, and when pressed, many abortion opponents can't differentiate between a human embryo and the embryo of a puppy, dolphin, or cow. Like the human sperm and unfertilized egg that came before, a human embryo might be, in the strictest sense, alive. But it is not a person. If anti-abortion activists believe that a cluster of developing cells constitutes human life, they must then be asked to defend the hundreds of millions of wriggling sperm cells produced in ejaculation and all unfertilized eggs expelled from the female body every month. After all, sperm and egg represent genetic halves of potential human beings. I once heard an interesting question for the intelligent design crowd. If your birth is a matter of divine destiny, why did God bother with the millions of other sperm? Of course, religious institutions like the Catholic Church do lay claim upon these genetic halves, forbidding contraception beyond the rhythm method linked to a woman's infertile period during the menstrual cycle, the Church has long been an instrument of sexual control, especially over women, and has proven consistently and tragically late to the Science and Human Rights Party. This is true for America's major Protestant religions, as well as other faiths worldwide. Ironically, 68% of Catholic women ignore the priests and use some form of contraception, whether sterilization, IUD, or the pill. Skipping forward to the 10th week of human pregnancy, the face of the fetus begins to take on human features. In the second trimester, fingers and toes become developed and defined, and the fetus has eyelashes, fingernails, and even hair. The nervous system is beginning to function, and the six-inch-long form has genitalia and a discernible heartbeat. At six months, the bronchioles of the lungs begin to develop. By week 32, the fetal brain can control breathing and body temperature. For many, the development of distinctly human features heightens the sense of moral dilemma with the ill-defined viability of the fetus triggering passionate debate between, and sometimes within, the opposing camps. Over 90% of abortions are performed in the first trimester. 7.6% are performed between the 14th and 20th week, and 1.3% are performed at 21 weeks or later. So when does an unviable fetus become a human person? And does a living organism have rights that supersede the privacy and bodily autonomy of its host? Anti-abortion opponents have long seized upon late-term horror stories, an example being President Trump in his 2019 State of the Union address. Quote, New York cheered with delight upon the passage of legislation that would allow a baby to be ripped from the mother's womb moments before birth. Trump egregiously misrepresented New York law, which allows abortions after 24 weeks if, quote, there is an absence of fetal viability or the abortion is necessary to protect the patient's life or health. Trump also declared that the governor of Virginia had, quote, stated he would execute a baby after birth. In fact, Governor Ralph Northam was speaking about non-viable fetuses born with severe deformities being assessed and resuscitated if the mother and family desired it. 
This kind of fear-mongering is effective among evangelical conservatives. Their indignation is often not rooted in the laws and the data, but instead knee-jerks into panic over sermons about babies tossed into dumpsters in the name of liberal selfishness and convenience. Many declare that no maternal condition would ever warrant a third-trimester abortion, a claim that simply isn't true. The American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists explains that women in late pregnancy might experience premature rupture of membranes and infection, preeclampsia, placental abruption, and placenta accrete that might endanger their lives. In those cases, doctors terminate the pregnancy rather than lose the pregnant woman to blood loss, stroke, or septic shock. Drifting from an emphasis on early pregnancy privacy toward later pregnancy viability, Roe v. Wade provides unrestricted abortion rights in the first trimester and tightens the conditions as time progresses. The Supreme Court also gave individual states permission to determine their own boundaries in the later stages of fetal gestation, and states' laws reflect the political slant and religiosity of their citizens. Some states require a licensed physician, others do not. Some states restrict insurance coverage of abortion, others do not. Some states have a mandatory waiting period and required counseling, others do not. Alabama, Louisiana, Mississippi, Ohio, Georgia, Kentucky, and Arkansas are among the most restrictive states, while New York, Vermont, Maine, California, Washington, and New Mexico are among the states providing greater protections on abortion rights. As an Oklahoma evangelical, I was once radar-focused on the rights of the unborn, yet largely ambivalent about babies outside the womb. Once an umbilical cord was cut, my indignation waned. In retrospect, I realize that I wasn't pro-life as much as I was pro-birth. I've met very few evangelicals who would ever consider adopting a baby, quote, rescued from abortion. The baby might be sentenced to a miserable existence, but at least it was existing outside the womb. Somehow, this fact is supposed to constitute an argument for the sanctity of life. I, along with an alarming number of pro-lifers, conveniently ignored issues like the availability of contraception, societal restraints, economic hardships, education, partner challenges, and unreadiness for parenting. I'd bought the lie that women almost always spent their post-abortion lives wallowing in shame, sadness, and regret. By the way, that's been measured statistically. Most women who have abortions have no regrets. I had reduced the rights of women against the greater rights of an unborn soul, and I tethered my opinions to a religion long guilty of subjugating women for being women. Our moral outrage was sincere, but it was also myopic and discriminatory. Even as we expressed verbal sympathy for those with unwanted pregnancies, my family and my church painted abortion rights advocates as rudderless, godless baby killers. Our hypocrisy at full volume as we empathized with a cluster of cells while ignoring or vilifying those who decided not to develop them to term. As Donald Trump recently added two conservative activist judges to the Supreme Court, Roe v. Wade is again a target for evangelicals. Yet that law remains a reasonable approach to the complex problems of bodily autonomy, female reproductive choice, fetus viability, and personhood. As we discuss the ethics of terminating pregnancy at late term, we better our perspectives by understanding how fetuses develop, when those fetuses might survive outside the womb, and ultimately by acknowledging that a woman's body is not the property of any other person, any church, or any government. States like Alabama might declare themselves the arbiters of personal decisions, but they're rationalizing greater health risks greater misery, and an unjustifiable invasion of privacy. At this point, we should discuss the elephant in the room, patriarchy. 
The opposition to abortion carries a strong element of male dominance, female subjugation, and sexual shaming. Throughout history, overtly and subconsciously, men have demanded submission from females. A great example is a popular chart revealing Christianity's God-ordained hierarchy, with men accountable to God and women accountable to men. Christianity has evolved many of its notions about the woman or wife as homemaker and child-bearer, but the Bible remains clear in its attitudes about females. In Genesis 3.16, in the Garden of Eden, God punished Eve's disobedience through the pain of childbirth. I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children. In that same verse, Eve's sexual desire was part of a divine curse because she had tempted Adam with the forbidden fruit. And thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. At the beginning of the world, Yahweh, a male, and Adam, a male, had already staked a claim to a woman's identity, sexuality, and reproductive processes. Still drawing from the curse, Scripture mutes the voices of women. 1 Timothy 2, 11-14 Let the women learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man but to be in silence. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. The Bible constantly treats females as secondary, even disposable. Throughout Scripture, women were tossed to mobs of rapists, stoned for being rape victims, sold into slavery, barred from God's temple, banished during menstruation, burned as witches, forced to miscarry what were considered to be illegitimate fetuses, kidnapped as war plunder, and generally shamed as temptresses. As Eve brought Adam into sin, the woman brought humankind into sin and calamity, and females have remained targets of shame and blame ever since forever locked under the divine edict to submit, submit, submit. Given their second-class status, it's interesting to watch so many Christian women embrace their assigned roles. I distinctly remember a conversation with a friend, a Christian mother of three, who felt quite content to stand in her husband's shadow. She eagerly admitted that she left the big decisions to the man, and she was adamantly anti-abortion on moral grounds. I don't know her position on contraception. Her example combines two common elements, subjugation to male authority and a fervent conviction that an embryo has a soul. Both attitudes are rooted in Christianity— and informed by a long and sordid history of misogyny and sexual control. I wasn't conscious of feeling any sense of ownership over women when I was a devout Christian. My mother was and is a strong woman in an equal partnership with my father. She rejects most of the Bible's anti-woman verses. Mom was a fierce opponent of abortion on the very grounds first discussed in this chapter, the defense of the unborn soul. I inherited this conviction, and my anti-choice opinions targeted the fetus, with little focus on the womb in which it developed. The result of my attitudes was anti-woman discrimination, but the motivation itself was not. And I'm convinced that this common catalyst must be acknowledged by pro-choice activists seeking cultural change. This requires some stretching on our part. And that stretch is difficult. Empathy often feels like acquiescence. The opposition seems ideologically unreachable. And we resign ourselves to steamrolling over adversaries with sheer verve. We don't think we can talk them down, so we shout them down. And opportunities for discourse devolve into trench warfare where both sides dig into established positions. Certainly, there are necessary moments for raised voices and strong demonstrations, but we can balance those against genuine opportunities to listen to, empathize with, and educate the victims of bad ideas. 
I was once a victim of indoctrination and ignorance, yet my attitudes evolved, not because I was provoked and humiliated, but because rationalists saw me in three dimensions and took time to show me the better path. I was free to discard the idea of magical souls taught by a bigoted Bible, and I found my place along human rights activists spanning genders, colors, and cultures to defend and celebrate reproductive choice. I am a living example that this transformation is possible, and if it's possible for me, it's certainly possible for others as well. And that's chapter 11 from my book, Confessions of a Former Fox News Christian. I hope you feel that we approached a very complex subject honestly and with integrity and with respect. Certainly, we've been able to do so without having to look through the distorted lens of religion, which I think is one of the most important approaches. You know, let's approach it scientifically and as human rights activists, protecting the rights and the freedoms and the bodily autonomy of our fellow human beings. I so appreciate you listening. Be safe out there, my friends. I'll see you back here next week on the Thinking Atheist podcast. Follow The Thinking Atheist on Facebook and Twitter. For a complete archive of podcasts and videos, products like mugs and t-shirts featuring the Thinking Atheist logo, links to atheist pages and resources, and details on upcoming free thought events and conventions, log on to our website, thethinkingatheist.com.